uh, three topics I want to cover today. Uh, number one, uh, the student loan company, Navient, they file for summary judgment against the CFPB. Uh, for those that don't know, that is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Uh, TransUnion um, gets sued for a payday lenders problem. So we'll talk about uh, these two cases. Um, and then we'll discuss whether or not it's good or, or bad to close out a, a credit card. So, uh, so diving in here, we'll start on the, the Navient case. So on, on May 19th is when, uh, so a couple, couple weeks back, that's when Navient filed for summary judgment um, against the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, so the lawsuit started about three years back under the, the CFPB director back then, which is Richard Cord Cordray. Uh, so the CFPB, with this, the story on this is that the CFPB sued Navient uh, because they believed that Navient was pushing customers towards a forbearance instead of an income-driven option, right? So basically, there's a, when, you, when you have a student loan, there's, there's, there's options if you find, your you know, find yourself trouble making the, the minimum payment or standard payment. Um, and so, so the case um, is basically that, that Navient was, was more steaming, you know, I guess steamrolling or pressuring more people into taking a forbearance. Which, so, so forbearance, by the way, that's where payments are temporarily suspended, but interest will continue to accrue. And an IDR option, an income-driven uh, option, is uh, there's different payment plans. Uh, that's where there's different payment options. Uh, payments, you know, may be suspended. They may not be suspended. Um, they could, you know, reduce the payments based on income a lot. So there's there's different options for for an individual compared to a forbearance. And so, so Navient uh, urged the judge um, out in Pennsylvania, is where the case is filed, to stop the litigation, um, arguing that the CFPB has not brought forth any evidence to support its claim, um, and that the company, um, you know, basically their claim is that the company purposefully misled borrowers to into forbearance. So that is that is the CFPB's argument that Navient purposely forced people into into a forbearance instead of an income-driven program. Uh, so in Navient's motion for summary judgment, which uh, comes after an earlier move um, by Pennsylvania's clerk of the court last year, it, it actually, there's a in the summary judgment. What was unsealed is that the legal brief, the legal brief filed by the CAPB in March of 2019 was to bolster the suit. So basically what that means is the CPB didn't have enough evidence. And in this, in, 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 in this legal brief that was unsealed, um, it comes, it, you know, came to light that their intention was to basically make the case stronger because the case wasn't strong to begin with. Um, so they didn't really have enough, a lot of evidence that, that, the, you know, that Navient was really doing anything wrong. Um, <clears throat> however, by, by going this route, by the CPB wanting to bolster the case and unsealing this, this brief, it actually had the opposite effect because in the brief, there were a number of documents that actually supported Navient's claims, right? Navient's claims and Navient's arguments. So it actually, actually helped Navient. Uh, so for example, <clears throat> for example, there was a chart uh, that was found in the brief and this chart was used by Navient's employees for helping borrowers choose a repayment option. Uh, the chart placed forbearance all the way at the bottom of the list, right? So basically, if the argument is that Navient is going to kind of bulldoze people into a forbearance, wouldn't the forbearance be at the top of the list, top of the chart, maybe not even have all the other options on the trigger? Why even bring it up? So, so basically, there's a chart that shows that, that forbearance is like the last option, right? That's like the final option. Um, so that actually helps Navient. Um, and the chart also, on the chart, it even explicitly stated that forbearance should not be discussed until all the options have been exhausted, right? That's even on the chart itself. So that's part of Navient's policy is don't even talk about forbearance, let me bring it up unless you've exhausted all the options. So again, Navient's, I mean, uh, CFB is claiming you guys are, are steamrolling people into forbearance. Navient's saying, no, we're not. And uh, CPB doesn't have any evidence, but they want to find evidence. Like, you know, why, why sue if you don't have evidence? Um, and then when, when the, 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 the brief was unsealed, actually more evidence came to the light that Navient is actually in the right, not in the wrong. And uh, also, uh, the brief also revealed that the CPB basically cherry-picked evidence in the case. Uh, Navient asked the CPB to identify specific borrowers who were supposedly harmed by their business practices. The CPB brought up uh, 15 witnesses and uh, Navient had the chance to examine the records of these witnesses and it showed that Navient hadn't done anything 
uh, to intentionally mislead them. In fact, it turned out that one of the witnesses had actually lied uh, to Navient about their income to be eligible for another repayment option. So that was actually one of the witnesses. So in the summary judgment, the, the motion for summary judgment states that the CPB no longer seeks to prove that Navient affirmatively pushed borrowers into a forbearance and that the CPB does not even seek to prove that Navient kept borrowers in the dark about the income-driven programs. And so the motion also makes the, makes the point that the CPB is just using the lawsuit to impose new student loan regulations rather than going through the formal rulemaking process. This is what they do. Uh, it's very, this, is, this is very, very true from, from the article because in our industry, we're kind of seeing that as well. The CPB uses, picks on industries from time to time, picks on a couple companies, you know, few here, few there. Uh, in my opinion, the way they go about it, the, the CPB, it's to me, it's kind of like the cartel in a way, which is basically they pick on someone who really can't defend themselves, someone who probably would be scared, uh, say, hey, look, you know, we're going to come after you for, you know, a million dollars. And like, well, I don't have that kind of money. Well, we'll settle out for, you know, for, for 50,000 or 100,000. If you just sign this letter that says we're, we're in the right, you're in the wrong, basically admit to guilt, even though you may not even be guilty, but just sign it so we can, you know, we'll let you go. We'll, we won't let you, we won't have you pay the million dollars. Just, just pay the 50,000 or a hundred thousand, whatever, sign this letter that we're right, you're wrong. And then we'll go away. Uh, they do this, they do this for, for, you know, through, through many different companies, many different industries, just so they can build up this, 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 this case that doesn't even really exist. Uh, to kind of change certain rules or certain things that, that are going on in certain industry. You see it in the credit repair industry, debt settlement industry, student loan industry. Uh, so, so in my opinion, how the CAPB goes about it is, is, is immoral. Uh, it's unjust. And if you, want to, if you want to change the law, if you want to make changes, go about it the, the right way. Pass legislation. Don't, don't go after these, these, uh, these companies when you don't even have, they're not even doing anything wrong in the first place. You're just trying to make an example of them and, um, kudos to Navian for standing their ground. Uh, Lexington Law has also been standing their ground for the repair industry. So, you know, we're uh, there's there's companies, larger companies that you know are 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 sick and tired of of the CPB not really doing their job. Their job is to protect consumers. So they have really two divisions. They have the enforcement division, and they also have like the consumer division. The consumer division is fine. You know, they're 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 doing their job. But this the 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 enforcement one, they're just poor, poorly ran, poor, poor job um, that, that they're doing. Uh, so what do I tell you this? Well, I tell you this because it's important to know who the regulators are in the industry, kind of what they're all about, what their true colors, um, you know, you know, really, really who they are and what they're trying to do. Uh, they pretend to care about the consumer and maybe they do again, I guess what they have two divisions, but you know, the on, on, you know, an appearance, you know, is that they, that they try to, you know, care about the consumer, but really their true agenda is to get laws passed the unconstitutional way uh, to further, in my opinion, this this idea of this this utopia that that's not going to exist. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of what's going on with Navient. That's been a long case that's been going on for some time, and uh, you know, it looks like they're gonna looks like they're gonna win that because CPB doesn't have any evidence. All right. So next next topic is the uh, TransUnion actually gets sued over uh, debt legality. Um, and uh, it's really a payday lenders issue, but uh, TransUnion is the one that gets sued. So it's very interesting, very important to know this as well. When we're talking about the Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, who's responsible for, for, for the debt, who holds the paper, that kind of stuff. So there's, there's two, two individuals here, Joseph Denon and uh, Adrian Padgett. Uh, they both attain loans from online uh, payday lenders that are affiliated with uh, Native American tribes. Uh, so, so Denon, he actually took out, he's in, he's from New Jersey. He took out a loan for about $1,600 from Plain Green LLC. And the interest rate, of course, you know, was in the excess of 300% because it's a payday loan. And uh, however, what's interesting is that the, the laws, the way the contract is worded, it's, it's, it's basically has nothing to do with the law uh, from the borrower's resident where, where you know new jersey right so when you're doing business and you're in a consumer is in a different state your 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 contract your your practices have to be based on you know what is required for that state so this contract the payday loan actually has nothing you know has no new jersey uh laws in there so that's 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 issue number one 
And so when Dennis start, 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 when Dennis stopped making the monthly payments, of course, Plain Green, which is the payday lender, they reported a TransUnion. Remember, he borrowed 1600 Plain Green reported to TransUnion that he had owed 2600 or actually 2700 That's the problem with payday loans, right? You almost never get out of it. It's, 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 it's almost endless. It's very hard to get out of it. So uh, what's interesting, too, is that payday loans typically don't report to the Bureau. So it's interesting that this one actually reported. I think Speedy Cash is one that reports in most cases, but it's interesting that they even reported uh, to the Bureau. So, so Plain Green reported to TransUnion. Um, again, originally borrowed 1600 reported that he owed 2700 And, uh, of course, Denon, the, the, the plaintiff, he disputed the report to accuracy, and TransUnion investigated and verified the accuracy of the information furnished by Plain Green. So this is the issue. So Denon, the, the consumer in this case, is, is, is arguing the fact that the balance is incorrect, which he, he's got a good argument there because I borrowed 1600 How do I owe 2600 2700 well, the rate has a, has a big part to, to do with that, but he's not in the wrong for wanting to argue that. He's arguing that the issue is he went after the way he went about it. Well, the way he started it is, is fine, but then the lawsuit, the lawsuit went in the wrong direction. So we'll talk about that here in a bit. So obviously when you dispute something, the dispute goes to TransUnion. And when the dispute letter arrives, as we know, it gets scanned into, into the system. The, the dispute letter gets converted into, into just you know encrypted code. Uh, you know, and you know, automation sequences begin. They notify the uh, the furnisher of that information. Hey, you have a dispute. Here's the basis of the dispute. So when that dispute came to TransUnion, within 24 hours, TransUnion would then notify the payday lender in this case. And the dispute, it doesn't say the you know what he disputed, but more than likely, he probably disputed. Hey, this balance is incorrect, right? You know, please investigate. And if it's you know incorrect, then delete the account, right? That's probably the, the basis of the dispute. That's how most the majority of disputes are are, are done. Um, and so that probably was the argument was this balance is incorrect. So when TransUnion forwards that dispute to the payday lender, hey, your consumer, your client here says the balance is incorrect. So please, you know, respond to the dispute. Well, the payday lender is going to say, you know, they have somebody that does the disputes. And, okay, let's look it up, the records. Okay, find the client. They can, you know, social balance. He says it's incorrect. No, it's it's correct. That's the right balance. And then they just respond to the dispute. They nope, it's correct. And TransUnion goes back to the consumer and says, okay, no, they responded. They said it's correct. So, you know, that's the end of the day. That's the end of the dispute. That's typically how most disputes are, are, or investigations are, are, are done. So, so that's Denon's case. And so Paget, the other, uh, the other consumer, she's from Florida. She borrowed $900 from Great Plains and uh, $1,600 from, from Plain Green as well. Each, each loan had an interest rate over 300%, um, subject and governed to tribal law, not to the law where the, where they, where they, where the consumer lives. Uh, Paget stopped making monthly payments. Lenders reported to TransUnion delinquent accounts of twenty six hundred and a thousand forty two. Oh, so they also got. She also had uh, negative information reported to her credit as well. So they both brought a a, a class action lawsuit against TransUnion, um, alleging it violated two provisions of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, which requires consumer reporting agencies to assure maximum possible accuracy of the information contained in the credit report. So their suit is against TransUnion, um, when in actuality, they really should have gone after the, the payday lender. I think that the, their, their case would have been that the contracts ha uh, have verbiage that are not pertaining to our state where we reside, right? And I think they would have had a good case there. I think they had a good argument in going after the payday lenders directly, but they went after TransUnion, they went after TransUnion over a Fair Credit Reporting Act uh, violation. But the district court dismissed the case, finding that the cited provisions of the act did not require TransUnion to verify the legal validity of the reported de uh, debts. So that's the issue. So they also sued based on the fact that the debts are invalid and because probably because of the contract argument, maybe they were trying to go about it the right, the right way, but they sued the wrong person. They sued TransUnion. They should have sued the, uh, the, the payday lenders. Um, so they lost that case. They did file an appeal. And um, the, uh, the, uh, the appellate panel began by noting that the plaintiffs did not sue the lenders to avoid their debts, nor did they seek an adjudic adjudic adjudication to invalidate them. So, um, you know, again, they're just they're going about it the, the wrong way. But it's interesting how the, the, the case here is brought against TransUnion. In fact, I, I do believe they do bear a big amount of, of cases where if the, if the attorney 
that they that they hired knew consumer debt you know laws a little bit better or knew who who what's going on here they would have known to not really go after TransUnion, maybe bring them in to strengthen the case, um, to get them to maybe testify against um, the uh, the payday lenders, but really they should have gone after the payday lenders. Um, they would have had a better chance there and, and doing that. But uh, so when it, when it comes to debt, debt validation, debt validation is, is, is better done directly to the furnisher of that information, right? We're, we're seeing that in our process. And, you know, when, when, when Eric and Sherry take, take over the file, where we're asking the debt collectors to validate the debt is, is legit, is, is accurate, belongs to the consumer, they have the license to collect the type of debt in the states, uh, all that stuff. We're asking them to validate the debt. You can't, you don't ask the, the consumer reporting agency, you don't ask TransUnion, you don't ask Experian, you don't ask Equifax to validate their, the, the debt. That's not their job. They're not required to do that. Um, and so that's, that's a, it's a very unique uh, thing that, 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 this, that this happens and because it's a, the reason why I bring it up is to just talk about that validation and the purpose behind it. And so, you know, it's a great avenue to explore um, out, you know, and instead of just continuing to argue with the credit reporting agencies, uh, a great avenue to explore is to, is to ask the, the debt collector or the data furnisher to, to validate the debt and you'll see different outcomes as we, as we are seeing and witnessing ourselves. Uh, so again, you know, the credit reporting agencies are not bound uh, to, you know, to, to, to legally investigate and, you know, to validate if the debt is legit, the, you know, if the company is legit, um, if the contract you sign is legit, that is not their job to, to do that. Um, but it's, it's interesting to see that, you know, many cases they are, you know, they, were, they are believed that is their job, it's not their job. Um, but, you know, something a little bit softer is just, you know, closing out an account. How will closing out an account affect your, affect your credit? So, number one, when you close out an, an account, uh, it does reduce your total uh, utilization rate, right? So, when let's say you have a ten thousand dollar credit limit, and uh, you know you have maybe a thousand dollar balance, so you have nine thousand dollars of available credit. Basically, your utilization percentage is ten percent in that case. There, if you close out that account, that available credit is gone. You no longer have access to it. Therefore. It'll it'll decrease your your uh, your your it'll increase your um, if I may, I may have that wrong but your, your your utilization will will decrease right the amount of available credit you have will go down and then that's going to actually lower your credit score right because if you have a higher utilization percentage then that is that is that is definitely not good for your credit score because FICO awards consumers. Um, more points if their utilization rate is low, meaning their balance to it to limit ratio is lower. Um, however, when it comes to installment loans like personal loans, auto loans, things like that, that does not affect your your utilization. Um, and then also closing out an account, it, it can decrease your average length of credit history, right? So, for example, let's say you have three credit cards. Uh, one of them has been open for seven years. Another one's been open for three years. And the other one's been open for six years. So the average length of history in that case there, in that example, is 5.3 years. So five years, five and a third uh, years. So let's say you close out the card that you've had open for six years. What does that do now to your average length of history? Well, you take seven plus three, which is uh, 10, divide that by two, and then you have five, right? So your average length of history would decrease from almost five and a half years down to five years flat. So that'll decrease your average length of history. And as your average length of history decreases, that's also going to decrease your, your credit score. Because the longer you have uh, history, the longer your credit score is, the, the stronger uh, your, the longer you have credit history, the stronger your credit score is, is going to be. So does it ever really make sense to, to close out an account? Um, maybe maybe if the, you know, if the account, maybe if you open a brand new account, let's say you had five accounts open for 10 years total. So your average length of history is 10 years. You open up a brand new one, right? That's obviously gonna decrease your average length of history. It won't decrease your, your, your total length of history, but it will decrease your average length of history because that brand new account. And let's say you open it, you didn't like it, you change your mind, you know, you're like, well, I don't wanna close it because I don't wanna hurt my, my score. Um, well, to answer that question, it depends, you know, because what if, uh, what if it depends on utilization at that point, but let's just assume that utilization, there's no issue. The utilization is fine. The question is, should I close this small account? I open it by mistake. I don't really want it, but I don't want to hurt my score. In a case like that, actually the consumer probably would be okay to close that account out because the average length of history actually by opening the account, it actually hurt them. 
Um, and then if they close it, then you know they can they can ignore that account, and so the average length of history will be based on the open accounts. Um, or you know another reason, another thing to do to remove an account or to have an account removed that's been closed is maybe it has some negative uh, information on it, maybe it's some late pays, maybe some maybe maybe it was a charge off. That'd be a great case to get that account just completely you know deleted um, because which is different than closed by the way, but just wanted to throw that out there uh, because you know that account actually is not the it's not the most, uh, it's not the best thing for someone having a report. They have some negative history on that account. It's actually better for them to have that removed. Uh, so that's really what I want to talk about uh, today. So uh, I know there's a lot of information that we that we covered, uh, but very interesting to see Navient go after the CPB demand summary judgment. That's really, really, I'm glad to see that happening. Um, see Trans, TransUnion get, get blamed for, for a suit here. And uh, we learned about closing out a, a credit card.